Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Let me welcome you to our service of worship. Let me invite you to take a moment to share an expression of God's grace, love, and peace with those around you. Glad to see you all today. Glad that folks can join us on Zoom as well. A um, couple things I wanted to mention. Are there, uh, let me ask if there are any celebrations, anniversaries, birthdays, milestones we might lift up today. Zoom folks, you can chat them in and Chloe will magically communicate them soon. Celebrations. Yeah, Debbie. No, no. Oh my gosh. The MBI Hospital Organization. I'll just make sure everybody here okay, I named your daughter Trisha the Employee of the Year. My gosh. I always tell the story that I first met Trisha when she was like, what, 14 or something, when the folks from this church took the youth group out to Frenchboro, and um, Trisha just finished her freshman year. And then not too many years later that she was um, doing like medical assisting, at, and I had a, I don't know, ear infection or something, and Trisha was doing the intake, and I was like, are you really old enough to be doing this? And now she, she's employee of the year. <laughs> I haven't aged. Um, oh, congratulations to Trisha. That's really cool. Robert Shea and Vernice Young have birthdays today, so happy birthday to them. Um, Mark Kandich has a birthday in a couple days on Tuesday, and Lori Ankrum and Martha Hobbs have birthdays. Christ oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, Russ. Uh, your hand was hidden right behind the camera, Russ. We got married here 22 years ago this week. Oh my gosh. Happy anniversary to you guys. 22 years right here. Oh, awesome. That's really good. Came back to pay for it. Thanks. See Lenny after the worship service. Scott, you have a birthday this week. Okay. Reluctantly acknowledged by Scott Hammond. And Abby Robinson um, has a birthday on the 2nd, which I'm not sure what day that is. I think that's Saturday. So happy birthday to all those folks. Um, Kate, and, yeah? Jason, happy birthday to you yesterday. 
reluctantly acknowledged like Scott. Yeah, oh, that's really cool. Uh -huh. <laughs> 29 and holding, great. So. Kate and Jane, if you all don't know, Kate and Jane um, have been playing music here for like decades, it seems. Welcome back, and I really appreciate you sharing your gift of music and ministry of music with us again this morning. Um, let, a couple more things. One is, in your bulletin, you might see little funky squiggles. Um, and you might think, what are those? But actually, if you hold your phone's camera up to them, they will magically take you to a place where you can share your contact information, that's the top one, or you can choose, if you so choose, you can share a donation with the church online. That's what that is, just so you know. The other thing is, um, I learned a couple weeks ago at the Sunrise Association Spring Meeting that Ken Brooks is celebrating his 50th year of ordained ministry. And I know you don't want us to make any big deal, Ken, and I won't make any deal bigger than this, but having known you for 20 of those 50 years, I am deeply, deeply grateful. And on behalf of all the people whose lives you have touched and all those to whom you have shared the gospel and with whom you've shared the gospel, thank you very much. Anne. Good morning. My name is Anne Lee, and I'm your liturgist today. I'd like to offer you a very warm welcome on this beautiful summer day. What a difference from last weekend. It's a beautiful summer day, and especially a welcome to those of you who, are, who may be visiting. We hope that you will find this service of worship meaningful and spirit-filled. We have announcements in the bulletin, which I'm sure you've all looked at. There are a few more to add to the list. We're, today, we're going to have a coffee fellowship outside on the lawn, which is a, a lovely thing to do. We'd love a couple of helpers after worship to bring the bulk food for the back program, backpack program from the boxes in the hallway to the tables in the fellowship hall downstairs. You can use the shopping carts in the elevator to make it easier. Another reminder, Juneteenth celebration this afternoon is from 12 until 5 at Knowlton Park in Ellsworth. And this week, the ever popular shaving cream wiffle ball will be on Thursday at 5.30 p.m. All ages are welcome, dare it. Are there any other announcements before I light the candles? I will light the candles and start our worship. quite a breeze. Please stand for the introit, which you will find either on the screen or in your bulletin. call to worship. Come, let us bless the Lord, in whom we find our refuge and safety. Come, let us bless the Lord, who surrounds us with abundance. Come, let us bless the Lord, who guides us on the path to eternal life, whose presence strengthens and sustains us. You are God. You are 
Our first hymn this morning is I Sing the Mighty Power of God, and that's in the Red Pilgrim Hymnal, number 68. standing and join me in the prayer of invocation. Beckoning God, you move in our lives, inviting us to journey to unknown territory, to listen for your voice and to speak your prophetic word. Empowered by your spirit, grant us the courage we need to journey, trust, listen, speak, and accept your commission to be your faithful people. Guide us to fullness of joy in the spirit and grant us strength to follow the way of the cross, which frees us to love one another for the sake of all creation. Amen. What do I have in my basket today, Greenlee and Jasper? Can you tell everyone in case they can't see it? Yeah, have fruit, right? What is your favorite kind of fruit? Do you have, is, do I have one of your favorite kinds of fruit in this basket? Yeah, you like apples? And what do you like, Jasper? Apples. You also like apples. Do you like anything other than apples, or is it just apples from in here? I mean, you also could like a fruit that I don't have. You like lemons, too? You like lemons, too? What other kinds of fruit do we like? Anything else? Do you like, you also like plums and cherries? Let's see, do you guys like oranges? I didn't get any oranges today. You like cherries too, yeah. So what, where, what, if, what does fruit grow on? Trees? What else? What do, what do we know about fruit? What does it need to grow? So it's plants and trees, yeah, it grows on plants and trees. And what makes fruit and plants and trees grow really well? Water, soil, and sunlight. 
water, soil, and sun, yeah. It needs to be cared for and tended to, right? So in today's scripture lesson, we hear from somebody named Paul, who's one of the apostles, and he's writing to one of the early churches, and he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and he describes them as fruit. And that's because we have to tend to the gifts of the Spirit, like love and peace, right? So we're going to tend to them, patience and kindness, like we do fruit. So how might we tend to the spirits and the gifts of community, like fruit? How do we tend to those things as a community together? Because we don't really do sunshine. How are we like sunshine um, to each other? What do we do? Do we say hi to each other? We're nice to each other? Yeah, what else could we do to help do love and patience and kindness? How do we share that as a community? Have any guesses? You said be nice to each other? Saying kind word, that's a great guess. That's a good answer. Do we have any other ideas how we might share some of those things with each other? No? Being nice and saying kind words is a great start. So that's a great way. So that's the fruits of the spirit. So we want to nourish them and we want to be kind like we would be to make fruit grow on our fruit trees. But it's our, the fruits of our community and our togetherness, which is what Jesus and Paul are teaching us about in the Bible. So if you guys would like to join me in prayer today, can you repeat after me? Dear God, thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Help us bear the fruit of the Spirit. Teach us to tend to the spirit soil. So we can all share love, joy, peace, and patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I know it's a long list. Amen. Okay, that was a long list of the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, so now we're going to go head out that door, and we're going to find our friends Livia and uh, Amber, who are probably downstairs, so I don't see them right there. Do you guys know where the classroom is? Awesome. They're on their way. If you all will continue in the spirit of prayer. Oh, holy God, we lift to you today the prayers of our community, the people in our lives or in our, this church who we want to wrap in prayer, prayers of healing, hope, comfort, and compassion. We pray for Carl, for Darlene, for Gertrude, for Levi, for Ginny and Jen, Chris, Brian, Todd, Rich and Sue, for Kathy, Kelly, Christina, Hannah, Misty, Wanda, for Helen, Joe, Barbara, Chuck, Shelly, Dan, Marcia, Meredith, Fred, Elsa, Terry, Lewis. We pray for our friends and the Community Life Center of Haiti, and we seek God's consoling spirit for all who have suffered losses recently for the families and communities of Anne Penfield, Sa Sandy Haggett, Hannah Wilkinson, Sherry Bitternan, Helen Berry, Paul Hattertel, and Nicole Monk, Monk, Monk me? Um, Holy Parent, creator of us all, you have taught us how to pray to pray our prayers of lament, 
our prayers of hope and for justice. Some days there are no words for our prayers. In our silence, hear our prayers too deep for words. Our prayers rest within us, in our breath, in our tears, and in our souls. You, O oh God, hold us in our grief and in our fear. As a path for equality feels far off and the future feels more uncertain, we pray for all those who are affected by injustice in the world, people both near and far, knowing that injustice affects us all. May we be moved by your Holy Spirit to advocate, advocate for those of us who are experiencing economic uncertainty, housing instability, hunger, and victims of violence in all its forms. We pray for safety and affordable access to health care for all who need it. Let justice come, let justice come, O oh God. May the world become more like your kingdom each day. Help us be agents of change so needed in this world, that we might be vessels for your work in the world, reminded that you that yours is a gospel of justice and of love. May your king, kingdom come through our work as we enact your love, a love that moves us to compassion, to advocacy, for understanding and for comfort. Open our hearts to your spirit until your glory is revealed in relentless love, in communities transformed by justice and compassion, and in making whole all that is torn asunder. We rest in your embrace, offering the prayers of our hearts, whether in silence or out loud, by way of our chat or through prayer request cards, which I will collect now. We pray for Gary and Shannon's daughter and granddaughter who are on a mission trip in Arkansas and for the country. For the poorest among us, as now they have more concerns. For the families of Julie and Vashti Johnson, both who passed away last week after long illnesses. And for a nephew, Joshua, and his brother, Aiden. To your love, O oh God, we entrust all for whom we pray, and our prayers, both spoken and unspoken, together as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing our response.
The scriptures this morning, the first scripture comes from a reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 1, and then 13 through 25, and can be found on your Pew Bible, page 948. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For those who are opposed to each other, to prevent from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us all be guided by the Spirit. Here ends the lesson. The second lesson is a reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 6. Pew Bible, page 8.43. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him, because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the, the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Thanks be to God, here endeth the lesson. Over in Moncton, New Brunswick, there's this place called Magnetic Hill. It's 
Some people are nodding. How many people have been to Magnetic? My gosh, half the congregation. Well, for just a few dollars, you can drive in, put your car in neutral, and as if by magic, coast uphill. What we perceive and what is actually happening are sometimes two different things. Martin Luther King wrote, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. For many this week, it feels as though the arc of the moral universe has been reversed. With head spinning Supreme Court decisions that render states unable to regulate guns, but able to regulate pregnancies. With some in the court aiming to dismantle other federal protections as well. This week I've come to recognize a few things which I'll mention this morning. I recognize that not everyone in our families, in our congregation, in our communities, and certainly in our nation, not everyone feels that the arc has been bent in the other direction. People's personal experiences and political perspectives sometimes lead to very different places. I recognize how tempting it is for me to hide my head in the sands of escapist privilege or in the gauzy clouds of a half-baked faith that would separate our relationship from, with God from our relationships with one another, overlooking Jesus' commandment to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. I recognize how even mentioning this during our worship today takes us within earshot of the culture wars that are designed to divide us so that our collective and faithful witness against the ravenously powerful would be rendered less effective. As I said on graduation Sunday a month ago, I grieve that older generations have placed such heavy questions of life and death on the shoulders of the young. Questions, decisions, and policies that may well determine not only the integrity of our nation and the viability of our democracy, but indeed the survival of humanity. This morning, I won't try to adjudicate our differing perspectives or sugarcoat the impact of this week's judgments upon our already fragile and fractured society. But I will ask for prayer. Selfishly, for me, as I navigate this in my personal and professional lives, for those whose lives will be affected and upended by these decisions, for our church family, longing for reconnection, for our communities as we grapple with how to ensure equal access to precious resources, from housing to healthcare, schools to sunsets, and especially for our nation, founded on ideals like freedom, equality, and justice, while at so many turns seeming to betray them to the detriment of us all. Let us pray. God of grace, pour out your spirit of wisdom and strength, turning our hearts to your presence and tuning our eyes to your hopes and your will for all people, forging community from chaos, hope from despair, justice from inequity, and peace from discord. This we pray. Amen. As you know, I was away last week. Went up to the north shore of the St. Lawrence River. Basically, you drive to the border of Maine, and then into New Brunswick, and then into Quebec, and then there's a river that looks like an ocean, and you go across that. It's about, I went three hours east of Quebec City, and in spite of Robin's well-intentioned efforts to teach me French. Most of the time, I was up a linguistic river with a notably porous paddle. I went on a whale watch interpreted in French. Béline, that's all I got. Or Beluga. I figured out when lap swims were and how much they cost. I made it across and back on two different ferries, and I recognized most everything I ate. 
No major mishaps. I was going to mention the, the locker room that was very confusing, kind of like European locker rooms where there's no real difference. You just find a little closet and change. And, I don't, and there was windows out to the pool. I, it was very confusing. <laughs> but on my last day, I went to a bakery. Oh, you're welcome. Come on in. Good. Um, I went to a bakery that, as word, the word was, it had the best croissants in Quebec, the whole province. And I thought I'd ordered four to bring home. Je voudrais quatre croissants, s'il vous plaît. They were amused too. <laughs> but lo and behold, when I got back to my car and opened up the bag, there was only one. Mm. Now, I could have flipped my lid, used Google Translate to generate all sorts of raw, hot headed foolishness, given them what for in my best Google French and assumed their worst intentions, that they had conveniently forgotten to sell me or charge me for the other three because I'm an American. All sorts of puffy ego stuff like that. As tempting as that was, I thought, but really, why? No big deal. Jacob would still get that one perfect croissant, and I'd find other snacks along the way home, eventually. We all encounter crossroads. We're reminded in today's readings, crossroads where we feed the wolf of wounded pride or feed the wolf of a kindness that connects and reconnects us with others. Both Jesus and Paul encourage us, plead with us, to take this more difficult path, one that's less immediately gratifying, but ultimately more satisfying. Let's listen. In his letter to the Galatians, a faith community at odds over whether someone first needed to observe Jewish religious practices regarding food and circumcision before becoming fully Christian. Paul reminds the church community there, it's not about what you profess, but about what you do that really matters. And by this he means how they treat one another, according to the flesh or according to the spirit. For the Galatians to focus on and argue about ritual initiation or food practices misses the point. And their vehement discord threatens the whole kit and caboodle. As Paul wrote, if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. I've got to admit that leapt off the page for me this week. Though neither his lists of vices nor virtues aims to be complete, Paul itemizes the works of flesh and works of spirit. The first, things like anger and jealousy, and the second, things like patience and generosity. Simplistically, flesh, bad, spirit, good. Ever since Paul's letter, the church has been tempted to imbue human bodies with fleshly attributes distinct from the higher attributes of spirit. This, of course, is a grave mistake. God created us as embodied creatures. We are not brains in a vat floating in space. God created us in God's image and declared us and all creation to be good. Our bodies are neither the origin nor the location of our problems. Indeed, and instead, let me suggest that we take flesh and spirit metaphorically. Let's acknowledge the parts of ourselves that give in to hubristic temptation, call it ego. And let's acknowledge as well other parts of ourselves marked by our capacity for self-transcendence and compassion. Not body and spirit dualism, but two hungry wolves, one of seething anger and insatiable ego, the other of compassion and patience. These parts of ourselves, Paul says, struggle continuously. Yep. Carla Works writes, 
Paul reminds the Galatians that the Spirit is at work transforming them into a new creation, into people who are more loving, more gentle, more kind. Following Christ isn't about marking the body through food practices or circumcision, but about being molded by the Spirit. The work of God's Spirit is the only way we can be freed from our own selfishness to exhibit in Christian love toward anyone, even those whom we do not like. Rather than being marked outwardly, Paul suggests that Christians are identified by how they treat one another. Carla Works asks, how will the Galatians know that they are a people of the promise, children of God, clothed in Christ? She goes on to answer, because they are a people who bear one another's burdens, who love one another as Christ has loved them. Rather than ritual initiation or food practices, what we do, especially how we treat one another, becomes who we are and how we are known to be Christian. As we turn to Luke at first glance, it might seem like we have a very different message. We hear this strange encounter between Jesus' disciples and the Samaritans in the village, and the exchange between Jesus and the three prospective disciples who profess their eagerness to follow him. Really, though, Luke's passage emphasizes both the importance and the difficulty of living the sort of faith to which Jesus calls us. The tense encounter in the Samaritan village is an object lesson in kindness. And the exchange between the would-be disciples and Jesus are stark reminders that living our faith isn't all butterflies and rainbows, but an internal and intentional and often difficult path of choosing and acting in ways that foster graced relationships and beloved community. First, Jesus and the disciples approach a village seeking hospitality and instead find rude rejection. Now, there's probably a good reason for that. There's the Samaritans and the Hebrews had history. But in any case, feeling hurt, the disciples asked Jesus, don't you love this, that if they can or should rain down fire from heaven. Now, what I note was kind of interesting is that, first of all, disciples believed, understood that they had the power to call this down. And second, the thought that maybe they should ask Jesus' permission to do so. I guess it's an attempt to punish the villagers for their rejection. No, Jesus says. Nope. And I love that the King James adds this. You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. The others just simply say, Jesus says, nope. Next, turn the page. Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. The disciples, once again, don't get it. They're indignant on Jesus' behalf, perhaps, or for themselves, feeling rejected. But Jesus says, don't bother. That's not how we roll. Soon Jesus encounters eager would-be followers along the road. And to each, he gives a sobering reply. Don't expect comfort. Leave unfinished tasks to others. For now, their task is proclaiming the kingdom of God. And finally, don't look back. Taken together, these replies underscore Jesus' response to the disciples, in essence, in the life of faith. Don't expect everything to go your way. Buckle up. Jesus' message lines up with Paul's. Ours isn't fair weather faith. This living faith is sometimes hard. Don't expect to gratify your egos or sleep easily or score points or win trophies. Instead, expect what we'll be led to do will not be our first inclination or natural reaction. The path of love, path of spirit, is neither easy nor well-worn. The muscles of faith need practice 
and training. Or as Dusty in this week's Bible study imagined Jesus asking the disciples, did you sign up for grace without commitment? Jeanine Brown writes, Jesus' ministry is about restoration, not vengeance. Likely we know this already, that living our faith can be difficult given how our egos and our magnanimity are at a constant tug of war within us. I'm reminded of this teaching story attributed to the Cherokee Nation. An elder was teaching their grandchild about life. They said, a fighter is going on inside me, a fight between two wolves. One is evil, filled with anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good, filled with joy, peace, love, hope, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, faith. And he went on to say that same fight is going on inside of you and inside of every other person on the face of the earth. The child pondered this for a moment and asked, but which wolf will win? The elder said, the one you feed. Amen.
What's the name of that? Lepers Waltz. Lepers Waltz from? Algar from Algar. But it's in the movie show something. And we just hear it all the time. It's awesome. Lovers Waltz by Elgar. Thank you so much. Wow. Nourished by God and called to live courageously and love stubbornly, we take a moment to recall God's faithfulness and sing God's praise. I invite you to stand. Generous God, we would grow with you and bring forth fruit that is pleasing to you, fed by your living water, giving sustenance to others. Lord, we would grow with you. Amen. Our hymn is found in the Blue Strength and Song Hymnal, number 212, and it's Whispering Hope. Continue to be at work in our lives, guiding and teaching, equipping and blessing. May our love and compassion continue to grow so that we will recognize what really matters and cultivate a life of faithful, joyous service. Let us live a life centered in the Holy Spirit, a life that bears the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, tolerance, and self-control. 
all the good things that come from following the Spirit, bringing glory to God and hope to God's people. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.